We're coming perilously close to the conclusion of our lengthy journey through the book of Acts. But before we get to the end, we are in the midst of a perilous journey that Paul and Luke and Aristarchus find themselves on the massive disaster that was their sea voyage from Caesarea to Rome. We left off last time with the question of whether or not Paul and company would be able to make it to their destination and not Rome, but it was a more humble destination by this time. Um, the question was whether they could make it to their destination just 40 miles down the seaway, down the coast of where they were so they could winter. Let's remind ourselves of where we are in the story. You remember that Paul had appealed to Caesar and uh, Festus sent him uh, by ship as a political prisoner along with his traveling companions, sent them uh, to Rome. They uh, were under the care of a, uh, of a uh, centurion named Julius. They departed from Caesarea. This is the area of the ancient harbor in Israel. Uh, on a grain ship, the grain ship would hug the coast from Caesarea to Lebanon to Sidon. From Sidon would hug the coast uh, all the way up through Asia Minor and so on. From there we put out to sea, sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. Again, hard to, hard to navigate when the winds are blowing against you. That's why they're hugging the coast and not on the open water. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, in between Cyprus is the island and Asia Minor is up here, and they're sailing right in between there, so Pharisees. We landed at Myra, at Lycia. They transferred boats from the little island hopper that they were in, the little, the little coast hugger ship that they were in, to a larger, more substantive grain ship that could handle the open water. When we had sailed slowly for a good many days, why slowly? Because they just couldn't open up their engine. They had no engine. Um, they're dependent upon the wind, and the wind is contrary to them, so slowly, for a good many days. In other words, they're really, really off their schedule. And with difficulty, had arrived off uh, Canidus, which is not easy to say. Uh, you'll see this is exactly how they went, uh, hugging uh, Asia Minor, you can see, and then at the very tip of Asia Minor, the westernmost point of Asia Minor, you see this little uh, uh, little finger that juts off called Canidus. That's where they are. Uh, from there, they are going to go. They can't go across that, so they're going to look for Pharisees by going down to Crete. So from Canidus, from that westernmost point, they're going to go due south and try to uh, uh, get under the shelter of the island of Crete. This is Crete as it is. Uh, where they wind up is in the center south of Crete. You can't read it, I know. Uh, but nonetheless, that little, uh, that little saddle that sits on the bottom of Crete, there is a harbor called Fair Havens. Now, as we look 40 miles west of Fair Havens, we're going to see Phoenix. So 40 miles, it's, uh, that's their ultimate destination for the winter. With difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lassia. And when considerable time, they stay here, they realize oh, they can't winter in Fair Havens. It's not, uh, you can see, it's... Uh, 
and still fairly open to the winds, and, and it's really not a place to harbor for the winter. When considerable time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, there are, as I was explaining last week, there are seasons in which you can sail on the Mediterranean, seasons where it is uh, off limits. Uh, when you hit, in the ancient world, when you, and the calendar is fairly similar today, when you hit that second week of November, forget about it. The sea, the winds, it's far too rough. I believe it was the 11th or the 12th of November. That was the cutoff date. They couldn't go any further. Uh, and they wouldn't be able to move until uh, the second half of February. And even then, that would be rough seas. The second half of February, beginning of March, is when the season becomes uh, uh, acceptable. But nonetheless... Uh, they realize, oh, they're running out of time. November 11th, November 12th is coming pretty quickly. The fast, Yom Kippur, was already over in this particular year, 59. The fast, Yom Kippur, was October 5th. So we're somewhere in the middle of October, and they still have a good portion to go. Paul began to admonish them. And he said to them, now mark his words, because later on in this passage, He's going to go back and say, I told you so. Uh, men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss. Not only of the cargo of the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Who is the centurion to listen to? Will he listen to this political president who just happened to be an apostle and a man of God? But that was, no, never mind to... Julius, the centurion, would you listen to experienced mariners like the captain of the ship, the pilot of the ship? He chose to believe them, trust them, because they knew the harbor was not suitable for wintering. They're going to sustain damage if they stay there. Not loss of life certainly, and probably not loss of cargo either, but damage to ship, most assuredly, if they stay there. So they decide to risk it. The majority reached a decision, a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could reach Phoenix, by the time we get to Phoenix, we can winter there. It's a harbor of Crete, 40 miles southwest of where they are. It's, 40, it's just 40 miles! It's not far, 40 miles. It's the harbor of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Perfect for wintering, safe from the winter winds, the rough seas. And here's where we left off last week. When a moderate south wind came up, Oh, that sounds so attractive. A moderate south wind came up. Supposing they had attained their purpose. Ha ha! They weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close inshore. This is the shoreline, the south shoreline of Crete. And they began to inch their way, slowly but surely, the beginning of a 40-mile journey that would result in their being safe for the winter. You can see what's going to happen. A little, uh, a little preview. Uh, there's Crete on the, uh, on the left side of the Fair Havens where they wanted to go, Phoenix. Uh, they are almost immediately thrown off course. Uh, the island of Cauda, and then they're worried that they're going to run up on the North African coast. That's Lebanon that we're looking at. Um, not Lebanon. Um, uh, Libya that we're looking at here. Um, but let's get back to the story. Before long, they rush down from the land. You're hugging the land because the land protects you from the sea winds. But from the land, blowing south from the land, a violent wind called the Euroquilo, northwest wind. 
And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, they gave way to it. They could not go contrary to the wind. So they gave up. They gave way to it and let themselves be driven along. That would be south, as you can see. Running under the shelter. Here's an island, a small island. It's a tiny island. A small island gave them some shelter. The island's called Kauda. This is Kauda. We were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. So without warning, the gentle wind that they said, oh, we've achieved our purpose. It was displaced by this draft sweeping wind coming in. A typhoon. How awful and well known and feared is this typhoon? How notorious is this wind? Is this typhoon? Is this it's so violent, it actually has a name, the Uroquilo. Right? And caught in the tempest, or east-north wind, caught in the tempest, thrown off course, borne along 25 miles to the island of Kauda. And the crew gains enough position at Kauda. They gain enough control of the ship to position themselves they used Kauda as a buffer zone, right? But how long will this opportunity of relative control and peace while they hide under this very, very small island, how long will this window of opportunity last? They take the opportunity to secure the ship's hull with rope, shore it up, keep it together. And the lifeboat, which was being pulled along, was not waterlogged. They hoisted it up with great effort, dragged it up out of the sea. Now they have another problem. They they're filled with problems. Okay, they're really stuck, literally between a rock and a hard plate. They. They've got this temporary shelter. They have this wind that's against them. And if the wind continues, they will be driven into what is called the Sirtis, the coast of Libya. So they're going to need to slow their momentum. So the wind slows. So they're not... They're not driven perilously. They're slowed down a little bit. How are they going to do it? They take their anchor out and they throw it into the ocean. Okay? That's not going to keep them in place. It's simply going to slow their momentum. After they hoisted it up, the ship's uh, lifeboat, they used supporting cables undergirding the ship, fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis. This is a... Uh, a uh, uh, satellite image of the uh, coast of Libya. The Sirtis, a pair of, I mean, I, I don't know much about the sea or sailing. You know, what I know about sailing comes from, you know, episodes of Popeye, uh, the sailor man. But apparently the shallows in this area of North Africa were notorious for shipwrecks and the wind driving them into the shallows of the Sirtis, the North African area, modern day Libya, would have been disastrous. But that is what they feared. Again, big picture. And Luke is very careful to make sure that every step of this journey, you know where they are. We left them. Uh, we began the story today. They were harboring in Fair Havens. They decided to move on to Phoenix. They didn't make Phoenix. So the Euroquilla wind blew them to the island of Cauda. That's where they are. Now, the ship leaves Cauda. They are blown away from Cauda. They throw the anchor into the, and to try to slow them down from, but you can see they're headed directly to the Sardis. They're headed directly to the north coast of Africa, and that would be disaster. But they're able to avoid that, as we'll see. 
They let down the sea anchor. Now here's a sea anchor. What is the sea anchor? In this way, let themselves be driven along. Sea anchor, uh, this is a modern day one. It's kind of like a, a bundled sail uh, attached by a rope and it would slow the momentum of a ship down. So basically, nothing fancy like this. They had a sail, the sail was tied to this rope, it would gather the ocean in as they travel, and it would slow their momentum. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they decided to jettison the cargo. So apparently, now, the crew really wants to lighten the ship. They jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. And the uh, quarterback, and the cornerback, and they're sending all the, no, no, no the, 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 the tackle, that's part of the control. They just, they're trying to lighten their load. They're getting rid of as many things as they possibly can. They send it overboard with their own hands. But the actions they took to lighten the load did nothing to alleviate their dangerous and desperate situation. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, I'm seasick and nauseous just thinking about it. And no small storm was a salient. That's how you know it's Luke. Mr. No Small. It, Luke's way of saying a big giant honking storm or a big giant honking disagreement or whatever. We see this throughout the uh, book of Acts. He uses this little technique, this little phrase. No small storm. In other words, the most humongous storm that you've ever imagined. No small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. They're battered by the storm. Two full weeks. Powerless in their ability to navigate by the stars. There's no stars. It's just storm. What is a sailor who can't see the stars? Just unremitting pitch black darkness that cannot determine their position. And everyone began to abandon all hope of being saved. 276 individuals, political prisoners, other kinds of prisoners, uh, uh, mariners, crewmen, 200 passengers, 276 individuals. Every one of them gave up every bit of hope that they would have had, except for one. One of the 276 voyagers retained hope of survival. Sometimes Life is like that for us. Uh, certainly not as dramatic as being driven out to sea and being uh, able, not able to uh, control where you're going, being completely at the mercy of the weather and uh, the sea, the power of the sea. But sometimes our lives certainly can feel out of control, feel driven by forces beyond our control. We try to turn ourselves around, but simply unable to do so. Simply unable to retain any level of mastery of our life's direction. Driven to and fro by the exigencies of life's circumstances. This is an interesting narrative that we find ourselves, we can read our own situation into what Paul and his companions find themselves in. Well, anyway, now the sun is no small storm. All hope of our being saved gradually 
abandoned. Many of us feel like all hope is gone. We had a little bit of hope at one point, but over time, over life's circumstances, over being battered by this wind, that wind, those waves, that waves, those rocks, gradually we abandon our hope of being saved. The question is, do we stay in that zone? Do we stay in the circumstance of hopelessness? Well, let's read on and see what happens. When they'd gone a long time without food, and you can imagine why they did so, because with the ship being rocking this way and the storm, who can eat? Then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice. I told you so. Here's where it is. <laughs> Paul's a great guy. Men, men, you ought to have followed my advice and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yeah? Okay. Do you have anything else to say, Paul, besides I told you so? Do you have a message of hope for those of us who have abandoned hope over these two weeks? And now I urge you, keep up your courage. Your courage has been suppressed Activate it. Reactivate it. If you have a little tiny bit of courage, foster it. Keep it up. Nurture it. Here's the message of hope. There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Which is great news for every individual on that ship. Not so good for the ship. And certainly not so good for the guys who are the owners of the ship back home, who are uh, all the cargo is going to be gone, or the ship is going to be gone. But everyone who's on that ship, no loss of life among you, only of the ship. Now, look what Paul doesn't say. Paul does not say, we're going to have instant calm. Your nausea is going to be your sickness, your is going to be completely abated. It's going to be clear sailing from... No, no, no. You still have to go through the storm-tossed waters. In fact, it will be so bad. How bad will it be, Paul? It will be so bad that the ship will be lost. But there will be no loss of life among you. How do you know this, Paul? I'm glad you asked. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me. Oh, you had an angel visit you, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. This is revelation that Paul had received back in Jerusalem from the Lord Yeshua himself. But here's a reminder. Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. That's good for Paul. Maybe Paul will be the only survivor, but no, no, no. Behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Everyone is going to be saved. So, who is Paul? To whom is Paul speaking? Who are these sailors and soldiers and passengers and prisoners that he's addressing? They're idolaters. They're pagans. But to make sure they understood the source of Paul's message, supernatural revelation from an angel who represented the specific God to whom Paul, this is not an angel of Zeus or of Hera or of Diana 
or of Mars or anybody. This is the God whom Paul serves and to whom he belongs. The message has come very specifically. Take courage. The storm will claim the ship, but the storm will not claim your life. Not one life will be lost. Therefore, keep up your courage, men. For I believe, God, it will turn out exactly as I have been told. In a faithless world, a world that has abandoned hope, the man or the woman of faith gets a hearing. Our world is like that. Our nation is like that. Our culture is like that. Slowly, year by year, decade by decade, administration by administration, you can look over time and see how our nation has abandoned hope. Until we are in the position that we're in right now. We're a nation that at one time, 98% believed in God. 75, 80% believed that there is a God who, not only a God, but a God who hears and answers prayer. We find ourselves today in a position where only 82% of our country will admit to believing in God. And a anemic 46%, something like this, actually believe that God answers prayer. In such a circumstance, a culture, a world, a realm, storm-tossed, nauseating in the extremity of polarization. People of faith will still be heard if they will have the courage to open their traps. If they will have the courage to speak that of what they know. And you may be thinking, yeah, 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 I'd have courage if I had the privilege of an angel appearing before me and delivering a direct message. We do not need, brothers and sisters, we do not need an angel today. We have the direct revelation of God given to us. So the Bible, the time these events occurred, 59 AD, there is no New Testament. There is no record given to us for the ages, given to believers down through the ages of God's plan, of God's purpose, of God's goals and the destiny of those who follow him. We have that written record, the word of God. But we live our lives as if we had no revelation. Because we don't read our word of God. It remains dusty and cobweb-ridden on our shelves. Or, perhaps, like me, you have 18, 25, 50 different translations on your phone or iPad or computer. But nonetheless, you don't read a one. And if you do read, it's not with a purpose or intent. It's with a casual, cavalier, well, maybe I can find something of interest or maybe I can find something that seems meaningful, but more often than not, it seems as dusty and dry as the unopened Bible 
remaining on our shelves. The Bible is living and powerful, electric. It's there to electrify, not to electrify in the sense of tasing, uh, don't haze me, bro, where we're knocked out and immobilized, but energized, fortified, electrified. When you look out at the, not this congregation, it's a special congregation, but when you look at a, believers around this country, would you honestly, would you characterize the church today of messianic and non-messianic variety? Just stereotypically, generalization. Would you characterize them as on fire and electrified with a message for a world that has abandoned hope? Or would you more likely identify the church as cowed and quiet and submissive and fearful and tentative? On that ship, there was no time for someone to be tentative and fearful. And Paul is saying, be strong, take courage. It's a message that I echo today to you, to believers. Be strong. Take care. I know you're nauseous. I know you're fearful. I know you're sick. I know it's been so long and there seems to be no deliverance. But there is a God in heaven. There's a God who sees. There's a God who hears. Is a God who responds. And there is a God who has a plan for his people. And if he has a plan for his people in a general sense, then it stands to reason that he must have a plan for you specifically, individually. If we live our lives as if we were confident that God had a plan and purpose, a destiny, in other words, for each one of us, what would our lives be like? What would our spheres of influence be like? What would the workplace be like? What would our families be like? How would we watch the news? How would we interpret the news? How would we read what we see on the Internet? Well, let's continue. But we must have run aground on a certain island. But when the 14th night came, two weeks, remember, as we were driven about in the Adriatic Sea, the Adriatic Sea, by the way, is, uh, technically speaking, is the Sea of Adria. It's the Sea. Not, not, not my wife, Adria, the sea of, it, it's, it's, the, it's the center of the Mediterranean Sea, the sea of Adria. They're being storm-tossed. The good news about being storm-tossed in the sea of Adria, welcome to my marriage, uh, the, being storm-tossed in the sea of Adria is that that which you feared the most, running aground on the Sirtis, on the North African coast, modern-day Libya, those shallows, not for you. You got a break, and you're just getting nauseous on the Sea of Adria. But about midnight, as they're being storm-tossed, blown across the Sea of Adria, the crew hears... On a, uh, 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 here's the sounds of sound approaching. They can't see. It's dark. It's stormy. But they hear ominous sound of land approaching. What do you do as a sailor? You take soundings. Determine the depth of water that you're in. They took soundings, they found it to be 
20 fathoms. Well, that sounds very interesting, but what is a fathom? I, can I fathom what a fathom is? Um, this uh, 20 fathoms, it's 120 feet. A little further on, they took another sounding. They found it to be 15 fathoms. Only 90 feet away from, you're 120, uh, you're 90, you're getting closer to land. But fearing in the darkness, that as they get closer to the land, they're also getting closer to being wrecked upon the inevitably approaching rocks of whatever shoreline they're approaching. The crew drops anchors, four of them from the rear of the ship fearing that we might have run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern. That's not their mood. That's the back of the boat. Uh, and they wished for daybreak. The pagans, they wished for daybreak. They wished that it were so. Many of us wish for different circumstances. Move your wishing to praying and see what may happen. Might surprise you. Well, anyway, they cast four anchors to the stern, wished, and, uh, uh, and they wished for <laughs> daybreak. But as the sailors would try, these sneaky guys, as the sailors trying to escape from the ship, they think that <laughs> going to land, that's suicidal. They're going to be wrecked upon the rocks. Staying aboard the ship is nuts. So a faction of sailors plot to escape in that no longer waterlogged life. They're trying to escape from the ship. They let down the ship's boat. Remember, they brought the ship's boat in from the sea. They let it down into the sea. So sneaky. On the pretext of intending to lay out anchors from the bow. The other side of the ship. The pole. Tattletale. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, hey, you know what's going on here? Uh, pay attention. He says... Listen to me and listen to me closely. I said no one was going to lose their life, right? But unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. You're all in the same boat. You've got to remain in the same boat. And the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let that dinghy fall into the sea. When a situation is grave, it is human nature to try to escape, look for a way out, try to figure out some. We have to realize that we are all in one boat together and we must remain in, there is no escape. We must remain in the boat together if there is to be a successful outcome. So Julius takes the, he had ignored Paul's advice once. He was not going to allow Paul to say, I told you so a second time. And the ropes were cut. And the only avenue of escape, that dinghy, crashed into the sea. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all. Take some food. Keep up your strength. You're going to need it. Keep up your strength by taking food. Two weeks, unrelenting force of the storm, perpetual nausea. Who wants to eat? Who can eat? But Paul repeats the divine promise, saying you better take some nourishment. Today is the 14th day you've been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you, take some food. This is your preservation. This is, you need this to, to live. 
For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. I'm telling you how the story is going to end, guys. It has a happy ending. But to get to the happy ending, you've got to keep up your strength. Take something to eat. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. What did he say? Rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub. Amen. Over the lips, over the gums, look out, stomach, here it comes. You know how Paul gave thanks to God. He said, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He said that Hebrew prayer in front of 270 something other pagans who had never perhaps heard that prayer before. Maybe they'd never even seen anyone praying to the God who made the heavens and the earth as opposed to worshiping Zeus or Hera or Diana or Mars. But nonetheless, he boldly acted upon his faith. He pray- Some of us, you know, we go, <laughs> we go to the restaurant, if any of us still go to a restaurant, you know, and are seen eating in public. But a lot of people, for a lot of culturally, feel uncomfortable praying in a restaurant or praying in front of unbelievers. It feels weird. It feels awkward. Whatever. Maybe the only prayer that they see in the course of a day. What? What if you go to Chili's and you bow your heads and you say a a word of thanksgiving before you eat your food? What about the table that's across from you and the ones that are behind you? Maybe they'll think you're a weirdo, religious fanatic. Maybe they will. Or maybe that's just the encouragement that they need, that there is a God and people still in this culture, in this country, believe that there is a God and a God who hears our prayers. There's still 46% of us who believe that God hears our prayers. We shouldn't allow the culture to tamp down the expression of our faith. I read somewhere that the establishment of our nation was predicated upon the free expression of our faith. Why would we voluntarily submit to the darkness instead of acting on the freedoms that God has given us and the blessings. Either God shed his grace on this nation or he didn't. Is it just simply the lyrics of a song or is it true? Well, back to our story. Broke it and began to eat. And all of them were encouraged and they themselves took food. Baruch Adonai. And Paul would have broken off a hunk of the bread and eaten it. Given thanks. And when everyone's eaten sufficiently, there's work to be done. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. I'd mentioned that number several times. You thought maybe I was pulling it out of the air. This is where I got it from. It's 276 people on the ship. And there'll be 276 survivors, according to Paul. When they had eaten enough, when they had eaten sufficiently, in other words, there's work to do. And they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. The cargo is grain, right? So you know the ship's going to be lost. You might as well lose it now so it will lighten the ship. It will ride higher in the water as opposed to lower in the water because of the weight of the, of the grain. And so they are tossing the grain into the water. That would allow them to get as close as possible, riding high like that, will allow them to get as close as possible to the land before being run aground. They're going to be run aground. That's inevitable. There's going to be a shipwreck, we know. But let's get as close as we possibly can. 
So when they'd eaten, when they'd eaten, they acted. Paul didn't lead a prayer service. He didn't say, we need a prayer service. We need to humble ourselves, pagans. We need to humble ourselves before God and seek his face and get on everybody on their knees. No, all hands on deck. This is no time for 50 days of prayer. You've already had your fasting. Forget about that. Get to work. There's work to be done. Our entire existence is on, is at risk. Shipwreck is coming. Let's get busy. Well, just a few thoughts in closing. As we leave our stalwart friends uh, a little bit waterlogged and getting ready to run aground on land from their adventures at sea, we can see the application, I think, quite easily to our culture. I don't think there's any saving of this ship, of our culture. As I read the scripture, I haven't had an angel, but I have the answers in the Bible. And it seems to me that not only our nation, but the entire world is spiraling down in a cycle of doom. And while as you, as e the water spins around the toilet bowl on its way into the sewer, it comes around and it circles, it circles several times. I think our culture can circle a couple of different ways, a couple of different times. And we can come around, we might be able to, I don't know if we can make America great again, but we certainly can make the preaching and proclaiming of our God great again. We might be able to make the influence of God in our culture great again. As, but the water is circling. We're in the cycle. So it's just a matter of getting ready, preparing for the shipwreck. I want to make sure that my son is ready for this. I want to make sure my future grandchildren, my posterity, I want to make sure that the people that I love, that the people that I work with, that the people that I, uh, my neighbors, my coworkers, I want to make sure we're all ready for that which is to come. So I encourage you, as Paul encouraged his comrades, take heart. Take sustenance, feed yourself, not necessarily on bread, but on the word of God, and prepare for what is to come. We read the end of the story, we know it has a happy ending, but it's getting there. I don't know that it helped anybody's nausea and seasickness to know that, hey, it's going to have a habit. That doesn't make your nausea, that doesn't make the seasick, that doesn't make your stress of the, of the moment go, maybe for Paul, special case, but for your average person, knowing the end, I don't know that that made dealing with it in the moment any easier, but nonetheless, they could take heart and prepare. So I believe that the message for the church today and for this congregation in specific is to prepare Take heart, sustain yourself with the word of God, have a common and sure understanding of what God has planned for us, and move forward with heart and in hope and in expectation, because God's plan cannot be thwarted. No matter how much darkness is out there, no matter how many people are out there uh, with, with accents or not, uh, pressing the great reset button uh, and wanting to make us happy by taking away all of our things. They can take away our possessions, but no one will take God away from us. No one will separate us 
from our God as we move forward.